Seeker, written by Susanna Thompson, performed by Heather Firth. Chapter 37 I go shopping for a wedding dress with Shelby while I'm out looking for a job. It has quickly become clear to me that working will be better than being bored at home while I'm grounded. I also miss my cell phone, even though I don't have that many friends to call. Shelby lets me use her phone to text Silas so I can still communicate with him. He has told me to pick out a dress and that he'll pay for it. He's also offered to pay for Shelby's bridesmaid dress, so she's shopping too. Silas has insisted on a church wedding, but we're not having a reception since my parents won't be involved. We are going to a restaurant with Shelby and the best man after the nuptials. Silas's new friend Michael from Bible College is going to be his best man. Despite the smaller scale of our wedding, I'm getting caught up in the romantic excitement of it. Trying on a wedding dress makes you feel like a real bride. I have been transformed from a high school girl into a traditional maiden in white about to enter into matrimony. Visions of a tux-clad Silas slipping a gold band onto my finger are in my head. Seeing Shelby in a bridesmaid dress completes the picture. We gaze into the mirror together. The look in her eyes is just as dreamy as mine. Wait till he sees you, she says softly. It's the first dress I've tried on, I protest without any real disagreement. It's perfect, she declares. I have to agree with her. I've already fallen in love with the dress and have no desire to try on another one. It's simple and sweet, with a lace bodice that gives the illusion of being held up by lace straps over my shoulders. The form-fitting bodice doesn't need the straps to stay in place, but they add romantic innocence to the dress, as does the floor-length tulle skirt. The skirt is detachable, however, and a sexy short lace dress is revealed when it's removed. Looking at it gets me thinking about the wedding night. Shelby interrupts my thoughts. What do you think? She asks and gestures toward her dress. I take a critical look at it, and I'm not as enamored of the bridesmaid dress as I am with my wedding dress. We had agreed on pink, but now I'm not so sure as I study it on her. It doesn't really stand out on its own. And I want something special for my only bridesmaid. Maybe another color, I suggest. We change back into our own clothes, and I tell the sales lady that I want to put the dress on hold. I text Silas that I found a dress, and he texts back that he'll drive up tomorrow to pay for it. I relay his message to the sales lady, and she becomes extra helpful about suggesting bridesmaid dresses for Shelby. She has several on her arm in various colors. When I spot an unusually short one among the longer dresses on the rack, it has an embroidered bodice and a tulle skirt that's similar to mine, except for the shorter length. The color is a very pale pink that the sales lady calls blush. As soon as Shelby tries it on, I know it's the one. It will perfectly complete our little wedding party. I text Silas again, and he replies that he will pay for the bridesmaid dress also. The sales lady then begins her sales pitch about shoes to match our dresses. But I've had enough shopping for today. We'll come back another day for those, I promise her, since I plan to pay for the accessories myself. Shelby and I make a stop at the mall to look for which stores have help wanted signs, but they all tell me to fill out an application online. Fortunately, my parents don't know that I didn't have to leave the house to search for a job. I take advantage of my freedom and spend more time at the mall than necessary. I'm still inside, but it's better than being stuck in the house. There isn't much I want to do outside in the cold. But I'll really hate being grounded when spring arrives. Do you ever talk to Mason? Shelby asks in a casual manner that doesn't fool me. Do you want me to talk to him? I question her with a smirk. Want me to tell him that you like him? No, 
she exclaims in a panic. Don't you dare. Oh, so I shouldn't have told him that you think he's cute? I inquire in a teasing tone. You didn't, she gasps with a horrified expression. I did, I confirm. Mila, she wails. I laugh at her reaction. What's the big deal? He should know you're interested if you want to go out with him. But he has a girlfriend, she says hesitantly. Maybe they're not together anymore. I'll find out, I decide. No, she protests, and then amends that in her next breath. Don't tell him I wanted you to ask. I have to, I state. We don't want him to think I'm the one who's interested in him. Just say it's a friend, she suggests, but don't tell him it's me. Okay, I agree, as I'm thinking that he'll know it's her since she's the only one of my friends he's met. She might be a little too sweet for Mason, I muse. He's a nice guy, but he does have that mischievous streak that's a bit wicked. Hey, what happened to that guy you went to homecoming with? I ask, as I recall Tara's disapproval of him. Oh, him, Shelby replies. He was nice, but there was just no spark when he kissed me, she explained shyly. I'm remembering that I felt the same way the first time Silas kissed me, but I don't tell her that. Yeah, I know what you mean, I say. She smiles wryly. It's kind of funny that Tara thought he was going to lead me to sin, but I wasn't even tempted. I wonder how she is, I ponder after her mention of Tara. She would be so jealous that you're marrying Silas, Shelby remarks. She would deny it, but I could tell she had a crush on him. She apparently doesn't know why Tara switched to being homeschooled, Okay, I'm going to tell you something, but you have to promise not to tell anyone. I admonish her. I'm serious, I stress, not liking the thought of spreading rumors. I promise, she swears. We are walking toward the exit of the mall, and I wait until we're seated in my mom's car before telling her about Tara proposing to Silas. Shelby gapes at me in astonishment, and she looks completely flabbergasted when I explain that Tara decided to leave school because of her sinful thoughts about Silas. Wow, she shakes her head. That's... I nod in agreement at her speechlessness in describing Tara's actions. I know. My gaze drifts toward the windshield, and I stare out in silence for a minute. They would kind of make a good pair, I admit. Silas is religious too, but I'm really not. I believe in God and everything, but I'm not that big on going to church. You better get used to it, Shelby teases. You are marrying a priest. It'll look kind of weird if his wife never comes to church. That's the thing, I confess. Why would fate put us together when he'd be a better match with Tara? I don't know, she says. God works in mysterious ways. He sure does, I agree. You should try to make up with your parents, she suggests after another minute of silence. When I saw you in your dress, it was just so beautiful, and they should be there when you get married. I'll try, I promise, because I would like to have them there too. As I drive Shelby home, I'm wondering if my dad will get on my case for being out most of the day when I'm supposed to be grounded. I'm surprised to find no one home when I arrive at my house. Maybe they went out to dinner without me since they couldn't contact me to tell me. It's their fault for taking away my cell phone, I think in annoyance at being left out, Dad probably wouldn't have let me go with him anyway, since he's the one who grounded me. 
I notice the blinking light on the answering machine when I wander back into the kitchen after walking through the rest of the house in search of my family. I'm surprised to see there are nine new messages. The phone rings again before I can listen to them, and the caller ID shows mom's cell phone calling. Mila, she exclaims when I answer. The desperate tone of her voice makes me feel guilty for making her worry. I'm okay. I assure her. Mila, she repeats in the same frantic tone. Come to the hospital. I instantly become frantic myself at hearing those words. What happened? Justin's been in an accident. She cries out in anguish. I don't wait to ask anymore. I'm coming, I say and drop the phone to the floor with a clatter in my rush to get to my little brother. He's okay, I repeat to myself over and over as I drive to the hospital. He has to be okay. <laughs>